Good evening and welcome to How Should I Vote? The EU Debate. Good evening. Should the United Kingdom remain a member of the European Union or leave the European Union? That's the question you'll get to answer in exactly four weeks' time when the nation goes to the polls on June the 23rd. For the next hour on BBC One, the News Channel and Five Live, we're joined by an audience of 18 to 29-year-olds from right across the UK and also from senior politicians who are here to try and help you make up your mind on what could be one of the most important votes you will ever get to cast. Tonight is all about you, so let's hear from some of you. Good evening. Hi, I'm Joanne from Leeds. Uh, I'm undecided. I don't know which way I'm going to vote, and I need to hear a really convincing set of arguments to decide either way. Hi. I'm Hayley, I'm 23, and I'm from Glasgow. Uh, this referendum is really important, but not a lot of young people my age are talking about it. I want to know how this will affect me personally. Hello. Hi, I'm Calicia, I'm a student from London and um, I'm undecided because I feel as though both sides of the campaign um, focus too much on the bigger picture rather than on the, how it affects the individual, whether we stay or leave. OK. Well, we'll try and get some answers tonight, as you might have gathered. These people here, and there are 55 of them, they all say they are undecided. These 40 people here all say that they are going to vote to leave the European Union and these 40 people over here all say they are going to vote to remain in the United in the European Union I beg your pardon and at the end of the program we will ask our undecideds if they've heard anything to convince them either way also with us here in Glasgow for remain Alan Johnson from Labour who is a former Home Secretary Alex Salmon from the Scottish National Party. He's a former First Minister of Scotland. He ran the Scottish Government and is now their Foreign Affairs spokesman. They want the UK to stay in the European Union. And from the Leave side, we have Diane James, Deputy Chair of UKIP and a member of the European Parliament, and Liam Fox from the Conservative Party. He's a former Defence Secretary. They want the UK to leave the European Union. And our first question tonight is from Muneeb Mir. He's from Lancashire. Hi, Muneeb. Hi, I'm 18 and I'm a student. I'm currently setting my A-levels and I plan on attending university. Will I have a job if we leave the EU? Will the economy be strong enough? OK. Liam Fox. Well, our economy is strong and we're creating more jobs than any other country in Europe, which is why so many young people are coming from other parts of Europe to, to come and get a job in the UK. And that is part of the, the question that we're looking at because we have to look at how we relate to the global economy, how we look to the European economy. And this whole debate is about what kind of country we want, what kind of world we want to live in. And I think it's about making decisions. And young people in particular, I think, are used to making very many more decisions for themselves, uh, what they want to read, how they get their news, how they communicate on social media and so on. Will, will he and have I, a job if he leaves the EU? I think he... Well, if, if, if you're uh, good enough to get a job, you'll get a job. Uh, the, but the, the, thing will, the thing here is, um, who will actually control that economy that you're talking about? And I think this is what the, the bigger debate is about. I I've never voted in a referendum on Europe either. I was too young last time I was at school. And I want to leave the European Union because I want to get control of the laws that we live under. I want control of... OK. I, wa I want to get control of our borders so that we stop... Uh, uncontrolled migration and I want to ensure that we use the money that we have in the best way for our priorities in this country including how we stimulate our own economy and how we make sure we've got the highest possible standard of living and I think you can only have control of those things if we leave the European Union. Did that answer your question Muneeb? Sort of but you don't... What do you think he said? He's addressed like the small parts of it, but he's not addressed like say the examples of our economy is sort of being pushed by unskilled migrants which are coming in from Eastern Europe and they're driving our economy forward. So if we're going to close that 
level and that route of migration, how are we going to replace it? OK, I'm going to bring in Alan Johnson now. <laughs> Will Manib have a job if Britain votes to leave the European Union? Yes, I think he will have a much a better chance of a good, well-paid, uh, decent job because part of our argument, uh, Alec and I, is the opportunities that, that are there in the European Union. So already Liam's pointing to the fact that our economy is successful. Of course, that's as part of the European Union, part of this huge single market, 520 million consumers that we sell into. <laughs> but, but it's not complete yet, and it's not complete in something that's very important to young people, which is services, uh, the creative industries, music, all those things that we do very well in this country. And most analysis says if we complete the single market in services, along with digital gaming, all those new opportunities that are opening, it will create something like 700 to 800,000 new jobs over the coming years. So I think this is the start of an even bigger opportunity if we remain in the European Union. OK, what do you... you, you... You go to university in the autumn, did you say? At the moment, I'm sort of tending towards staying in, from what I've heard now, is staying in the Leave campaign. Sure. I was just asking, are you going to university in the autumn, did you? Yes. Yes, OK. And what do you want to study? Economics and politics. OK. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Diane James, if, if Britain votes to leave, are there, are, there, are there going to be jobs? I mean, you know what the Bank of England have warned. You know what the Treasury have warned. I but think he's worried about that. I think you stand a far better chance of a good job a job that you're not competing with, with potentially thousands of other Europeans if we actually leave the European Union. Now, we've got 2.2 million EU workers here already. They've taken, effectively, UK jobs. We've got stubbornly high UK unemployment, around 1.7 million. We've got really still very unacceptably high youth unemployment at just, just under 700,000. And just do the maths, you know, 1.7 plus 700,000, that's 2.4, and yet we've got 2.2 million foreigners here. Now, if we continue as an EU member state, you've only got to look at the state of the unemployment market for young people in the southern Mediterranean countries, some, out, some instances of 53% unemployment rates for, for people like you, okay. your age group. So it's got to be a case of come out to guarantee yourself a really good job to guarantee see yourself a job and one that you don't have to compete for. OK. <laughs> Alex Salmon, you're on the Remain side. You want Muneeb, who's in the undecided section, to vote to stay in the European Union. Um, is he going to get a job? Will he, when he graduates, is he more likely to get a job if Britain is in the European Union or out? Well, it's more likely if we, if we stay in the, in the European Union because there's going to be more jobs in that circumstance. If a young man's going to study economics, uh, you'll probably be able to answer your own question in three or four years' time. <laughs> but in the meantime, the, I mean, I, I don't go with the scaremongering stuff, incidentally. And, uh, you know, you mentioned the Treasury and the Bank of England uh, just, in, just recently. I mean, the, the Treasury says it's going to be apocalypse if Britain left the European Union. I don't believe that. But I do believe what the Bank of England says, which is that there will be less growth and less jobs. Uh, and the bulk of independent forecasters say the same thing. So I think staying in the European Union because of the single market, because of the prosperity, means more job, and therefore you have a, a better chance of uh, a job. But there's one other aspect to this. Being in that European Union means that not just a single market of 500, it's a community of 500 million people. You've got the ability to, to go and travel, to work, to, uh, to visit, to, without a visa. You can go into Barcelona, watch some decent football. You've got the whole of that European community at, at your disposal. And a, a qualified person in particular has got an excellent chance of employment. So okay. the answer to your question, the straight answer, is it wouldn't be an economic apocalypse if we left the European Union, but there's more jobs and more chances if we stay in. All right, let's, let's hear from some people. People on the Remain side. Hi, hello. Yes, do introduce Hi. yourself. Well, um, statistic well, I'm, I'm Richard. I'm from London. Um, I'm a buying assistant in London. I, if you look statistically, the European Union has stagnated economic growth. Now, economic growth builds jobs. How, in any case, if, he, if he's looking to get a job once he graduates, surely out of the EU, if you look at countries like Switzerland, Norway, or even compare it to the Asian markets like Singapore, you can see all these countries are independent. 
and yet they've had far more economic growth. I think it's on average in the EU we've had about 3% per annum. It's, it, it's, it's terrible. The EU is stagnating growth within the economy, and economic <laughs> growth delivers jobs. Okay. Simple as. Okay, over here. Hello. Hi. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Praveen. I'm from London. And you keep saying that 2.3 million workers coming to Europe is a bad thing. Why is that helping our economy? And secondly, <laughs> thank you. to pack up my bags and move to Spain and start a business. I have the opportunity. By leaving, I don't have that opportunity. Yeah. You know. Where, by the way, wherever you, are in the U wherever you are in the UK, you can join us this evening by using the hashtag BBCDebate. Um, let me ask uh, Liam Fox, you're on the Leave side. How many jobs would be lost if Britain voted to leave the European Union? I don't think we, we know exactly what the impact will be one way or another. And the one thing I'm very clear is that economic forecasters nearly always get it wrong. But the point has been made that the European economy is stagnating because of the euro. A million jobs have been lost in Spain, Portugal, Greece and Italy combined over the past five years. That, is, that, that, has, that has an impact on us because it clearly means that a lot of young people will come to the UK. The Bank of England have said that every 10% rise in the migrant population in the UK depresses wages by about a further 2%. So it's not just a question of jobs, it's the impact it's having on the wider economy. And the European economy is now the, the, the lowest growing eco uh, continent in the world, apart from Antarctica. It's not what we want to tie ourselves Alex to. Alex Salmon, how many job losses will there be if Britain votes to stay in the European Union? The gentleman over here mentioned well, the, 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 the uncertainty, the, 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 well, the, the shackling to the, the block of countries well, quite, where growth is stagnating. Well, what the, the gentleman said was quite interesting. He said, look, what about Switzerland, what about Norway? And it's absolutely true. If the UK negotiated an economic area agreement like Norway, then you could minimise the economic damage. But you would end up accepting the European regulations without having any say, because Norway accepts the regulations <laughs> and it accepts free movement of people. Now, if you wanted to be a, a kind of mid-Atlantic Singapore, Singapore is a small country in a large trading area called ASEAN. The UK would be a big country out with a large trading area. That Singapore benefits. I mean, nobody in but Singapore... Many years well, ago, I was, Singapore so I agree, and all agree these people were well, developing nations. Yeah. They've grown yeah. exponentially, yet we were a developed nation, and obviously that's going to saturate out. We can't continue no, growth I, I, at I, the same I, rate. I take your but point. I, we I was, are growing at a hindrance. I was in Singapore recently, and look, nobody in Singapore says we want to leave the ASEAN trading area. Nobody says that. Nobody says we're going to leave that trading area like it's, some people want to leave to think Europe. That we can't but trade this lady with Europe. who said, why are we regarding these people who come from Europe as a negative. These are hard-working people who are earning their lives. They are contributing to the country. They are making the country grow. You, you described the uh, apocalyptic forecast from the Treasury. Yeah. Uh, the Chancellor, George Osborne, you're on the same side as him. Yeah. I just want to ask the audience here, when you hear those kind of forecasts of a recession, um, Half a million job losses in the next two years, said, said the Chancellor. Youth unemployment rising by 10%. Just answer yes or no. Do you believe those economic forecasts? No. Okay, that was broadly a no, I would say. I, I mean, these are people on loud. your side. It was a loud no from over there. It was, it was no, to be fair, it was no from yeah. these people as well, and the undecideds, the people that really need to be convinced. I mean, what do you make of the fact that people simply don't believe some of those forecasts? Well, well look... It's from the people every, on your side? It's every single assessment. Oxford Economics, London School of Economics, PricewaterhouseCooper, uh, then it was followed by the IMF, and then it was the OECD, and then it was the Treasury forecast, and now, but you yesterday... Heard, you heard what people said. Did, sure. Yesterday, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, highly respected, rubbished by the Leave side, as anyone who says anything they disagree with gets shouted at. The Institute for Fiscal Studies said this will take around 5% out of our economy. Just one point, the guy over there said we're the fifth largest economy in the world. We've been members of the European Union for 43 years. Maybe that's got something to do with us ah. being the fifth largest economy. <laughs> Well, that, 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 that's illogical because if our economic well-being was simply due to being in the European Union, how come our unemployment rate's 5.1%, the EU's 8.9% and the Eurozone's 10.3%? <laughs> 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 OK. 
It's part of it, Leah. It's part of it. OK, we're going to move on to our second question. And it's from Michael, who is from Glasgow. Hi, Hi Michael. I'm Michael Harvey. I'm 26. I'm a cleaner from Glasgow. And uh, my question is, uh, the Chancellor George Osborne says that Britain leaving the EU would cause a drop in house prices. And an audience of young people who are likely to struggle throughout their lives to afford adequate housing, why should we think this is a bad thing? You know, I'm always puzzled by the British obsession with house prices. And in, 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 relation, to, in relation to that, wherever you live in this country, I mean, we seem to think that, you know, the fact that houses are very expensive and difficult to buy is a good thing. I tend to agree it's a bad thing. But that's not the... Re all those economic reports I've mentioned are about interest rates going up, unemployment rates going up, about our economy tanking and a large chunk of our wealth being lost. As we turn our back, as we turn our back on the biggest commercial market in the world, bigger than America, bigger than China, we would walk away from it. So, yeah, I mean... Just hang on, hang on. Sorry, it, it would Michael, still be the biggest Michael trading Harvey, who asked us the question. Hang on a minute, sorry. Go ahead, Michael Harvey. Yeah, you sorry. So, you, so the one that I just quoted was wrong. So the, the no, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying it wouldn't impress me. Never mind yeah, you. So, but what, why is this being part of the debate then? Isn't this an example of a kind of cynical political debate that's appealing to a certain well, part of the, well, the vote? Well, that's, well, that's, 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 young man's right. Look, the, the cynicism in both sides of this okay. debate. Uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, in my view, scaremongers on the economy. The Leave side scaremongers on immigration. Let's just accept that's what they're doing. But nonetheless, Alan's right to say that the all of the reputable independent forecasters, they're not forecasting an economic apocalypse, but they are forecasting economic damage if we leave the marketplace. Now, neither Alan or myself are responsible for the utterances of George Osborne. Believe me, we're not. Uh, and therefore, what we want to do tonight is to put a positive argument for being in the European Union. We want to look at the European Union's achievements. We're quite happy to discuss where it's gone wrong and say what we can do to get a bit of idealism Okay. into this debate, a bit of belief and commitment, and leave the scaremongering behind. That's not what's going to win votes. It's the idea and principle will win votes in this campaign. Diane James. Well, it, isn't it interesting? And I take the point about migration. I well, really can do. Can we just Don't deal with wrong. Michael's question, which okay. was the warning but from I, the I Chancellor about house prices first, falling? I wanted to come back first there. We will, make, we will, we will come back link, to that, I promise you. To make the link, Victoria. Let's talk about On the basis that your point is about can you afford ho uh, house effectively, can you, if we remain a member of the European Union, is that going to be a, even a remote possibility? And my response is, you, it probably isn't. Because if we can't control the number of people coming here, hence my point to yourself, you're never, ever going to be able to catch up and you can't plan. Now, one of the aspects that Alan's party makes all the time is it's the responsibility of national government to provide sufficient infrastructure, including housing. I've got no problem with that, Alan. But if you don't know how many people are coming in, if your local authorities have got no idea how to plan, what to plan for, what the demand's going to be, and we've seen it with today's statistics, then your question is, quite frankly, I think your chances of affording a home are pretty questionable if we continue as a member of the European Union. Okay, Liam Fox. I, I've got no problem with migration. And controlled, is, and, we, and, and this, controlled migration. This is about can bring, house prices. Can, can the question bring, was why, yes, why? the coming. Chancellor's warning about house prices I'm, falling I'm is meant to be yes, a bad thing I'm when coming it's to not. It. I have no problem with migration, and controlled migration can bring benefits. But if you have an uncontrolled number, the arithmetic tells you it will put pressure on public services, uh, or on the health service, on schools, and on housing. And uh, no government in the past 40 years has built enough houses. It's a supply and demand problem. But if you have an increase in your population of 3 million, as we've had in the last five years, that inevitably means you've got a housing shortage on top of an already difficult situation. And it's going to keep those house prices up. And I happen to think that we need to have an increase in housing supply to bring the house prices down. It can't just be about those who've got houses already. Okay. It's got to be about young people being able to get into housing. We've got, a, we've got another question on the housing, actually, and it's from Emily. Hi, Emily. Emily's from Paul. Hello, yeah, I'm Emily Wood from Paul. I'm a music producer. My question to you is, me and my mum live in a council house. My mum is disabled and needs bungalow, which they're now in our area. 
Immigrants have bumped up the list because of this. Am I right to want to leave, basically? Is Emily right to want to leave the European Union because she feels that she and her mum uh, would get the bungalow that her mum needs? Alex Salmon. Hey. I wouldn't make that connection. If we have a housing shortage, we should build more houses. That's the, how you respond. <laughs> not... I'm coming to that. Not kick people out of the country. Now, why have I said about the scaremonger about immigration is this? Three and a half percent of the population of Scotland are from the rest of the European Union. So if you go outside tonight in Glasgow, stop a hundred people, the likelihood is three of them will be from other European Union member <laughs> states. It's it. about five percent. It's about five percent across the uh, across the UK. Now Liam says, how about the pressure on the health service? What about the people from the rest of Europe who are working in the health service? <laughs> Let's just say, let's just say that, that Boris Johnston dislocated his jaw this evening, you know, from overuse, <laughs> uh, and he went to his he went to his home hospital in Uxbridge, where 10% of the staff are nurses and doctors from elsewhere in the European Union. Do you think he's going to say, "I don't want treatment for my jaw because you're from Estonia"? Yes. This is nonsense. The These are hard-working people who are contributing to argument. this country. <laughs> Emily, Emily wants to come back. Discriminating that they're not hard working because they are. But at the same time, you have not got enough houses now. So how the heck are we meant to house them? We haven't got enough houses now as it is. So where are you going to put them? Okay, wow. over here. Hello. Hi, my name is Asma. I'm graduating next month. Yay me! Congratulations. Um, thanks. Um, so I'm from Aberdeen, like Alex as well. And so my my point is about the immigration first off. When it comes to the point about immigration, you need to factor in that we also, en masse, go to Europe even more so than we've ever done before. As young people in this audience, how many of us are going on holiday this summer? How many of us go on holiday at Christmas time and don't even think twice about it? We do so much with Europe, uh, and they're our partners. We're, we're neighbours with them. Think about Cali. How is the, like, the Cali jungle going to be dealt with if we're not still in Europe? When it comes to the question about housing, let's just think to a few directives that the, that the European Union has helped with, especially when it comes to rented homes and council housing. So it's because of the EU that we have certain regulations that allow us to have spacious, spacious rooms. Before then, a box-sized room was classed as a bedroom. That was completely unfair. And you could have been paying rent at like three, four hundred pounds a month for a room that was the size of a desk. How is that ever fair? The okay. European but Union how made does, it How possible. does that help Emily and her mum in Paul? Emily and her mum need to realise that the UK government are the people that can build council houses. Yeah, yeah. The European Union are not some kind of scapegoat for you to keep blaming yes. for your problems. <laughs> them I'm just saying that at the moment that is the issue that is an issue at the moment in my local area. MP we have tried to go to our local MP <laughs> and another thing right we've got a housing shortage now but the more we let in the less houses we're going to have to house them. So how do you work that out? It's, okay, funny, so it's, hang on a minute. it's funny that you've got a selective memory. Just remember how many immigrants, like my family, like a lot of the people in this audience's family, have built this nation. Talk about the <laughs> Emily, Emily, can I ask you, are you voting to leave? Because, I'm going to leave. No, I know you'll leave. I know, I know you're, I'm going to leave. I, that's, that's absolutely clear. You're voting to leave because you think that would reduce net migration to this country. Not just that, but it needs to be controlled. Fine. It does need I, control. Uh, OK, at least, OK. It needs right. control. Hello. So we give £350 million pounds a week to the EU. That is no, £50 million no, pounds a day. No, we don't. Could we not build houses? No, we Could don't. Could we not afford to give... Emily, account, uh, Emily's mum, a house that she needs because they We don't. Hang on, there's no. Po just hang on a minute. So, sorry. We don't give three hundred and fifty million pounds a week to the. To the yes, EU. we do. I mean, let's, okay, yeah, we do. Yeah. No, no. I mean, we. Oh, okay. It's just that the figure's wrong. They've been told to stop using it, but it's on the side of their bus. We don't. It's about how. It's about. It's about half of that. Yeah, I know you've got. 
no interest in the facts. But it's, it's, it's half of that. It's half, of that. It's half of that. It's half of that. What we get back, what we get back, according to all the analysis, is between three and ten times that value because of our opportunity, because of our opportunity to use that single market and trade with it. Fifty percent of our exports, seven of our ten biggest countries that we export to, all in the European Union. Liam you know, Fox we... is disagreeing with you. Yeah. Go ahead. Profoundly. It is profoundly wrong, because if you look at how much we give to the European Union, how much we get back, and, the, and we do get some money back, there is a net difference of around £10 billion pounds a year. Now, <laughs> so it's not £350 million a week? That's gross. It's not that's, a, that's a gross million. No, it's figure. Not. We don't even send we, it. Um, and we, so we've that, got it. We've it's got not about £10 billion a year. Does anybody think that we couldn't use £10 billion pounds to help improve the quality of the health service or housing or anything else in that, this country. That, and, that, and obviously, just to be clear, just to be clear, that means you wouldn't be using some of that. It's actually 8.5 billion net, but what, you know, who will argue about one and a half billion? And it's 11.4 next year. Hang on, that means you wouldn't use some of that 8.5 billion net to pay the subsidies to farmers oh, that the EU pays, that's, that's, to, to pay the grants to the poorer that regions money, the, the that's, that's, that's the net figure. That money coming back to farmers and university is our money coming back from the European Union. Yeah. On top of that, there is that around about £10 billion sum that we pay in net. And I think it's about control, and I think it's about how we use that money for the priorities in our country. I am not against migration, but it's about controlling it so that we actually get the best of both worlds for the country. And when you have an uncontrolled figure, when you have an uncontrolled figure, you unavoidably put pressure on public services, on schools, on hospitals, on GPs and on housing. It's unavoidable if you have that very big number. And it's not about stopping it. It's about understanding what you can get from it. But it's for us to have control okay. and for us in our own country to decide that number. OK, OK. Uh, just to let you know, uh, the deadline for registering to vote, by the way, and having your say on whether the UK leaves or remains in the EU is the 7th of June. The actual vote, as you probably know, is June the 23rd. A uh, couple of tweets using the hashtag BBC debate. Uh, Stuart Young says, will the economy be strong enough if we leave? Ghost Hands on Twitter says, people should look at the bigger picture rather than their own personal gain. Uh, when it comes to the EU referendum. And Mellon, who uh, is going to vote to remain, says a good and often overlooked point, I think. The Brits have free reign through Europe, as well as, quote, the foreigners. Um, <laughs> let me... Uh, let's get the next question. It's from Amanda Craig, who is from Glasgow. Hi, um, I'm Amanda Craig. I'm a student uh, from Glasgow. Um, my question is, both the Remain and Leave campaigns seem to be using Project Fear tactics. Where's the positive case from both sides? Alex Salmon. I, I absolutely agree with that point. But, uh, so uh, you agree that both campaigns oh yes, are uh, using negative I, I mean, it's almost, I mean, you know, we've been through a very recent referendum in Scotland, and it's almost as if Project Fear and the Scottish referendum has been divided in two, and one half of it is the Remain campaign led from, uh, uh, from London, and the other half is the Out campaign led from London. That's not the way to conduct referendum campaigns. We've got four weeks to go in the campaign, and if we want to truly engage people, then Alan and I have got to argue if the, the benefits, the achievements, the, the, the rights that, that Europe has given us. But and the, Project and, Fear won when it, went, when it, well, when it comes yeah, to yeah, Scotland yeah, yeah, and the and It works. OK, well, right, Victoria, we, we started the Yes campaign in Scotland at 28% in the vote. Oh, no, no, let's and not go back to history. Let's not go back to history, please. Now, this time, this time, no, you asked, you asked the question. This time it's eeksy peeksy. Uh, and we, you know, the, the, the Remain campaign can't afford to lose 1% a month, otherwise they'll lose over the next four weeks. To win a campaign, to motivate people, you've got to argue a positive case. You leave the scaremongering behind, okay, argue a positive case. I want to ask the undecideds. Case. Hang on a minute, I want to ask the undecideds. Has this... Have the campaigners risen to the challenge? Have they risen to the occasion? Hi. Hello, my name's Kieran Duffy, I'm 21, and I'm a Rally one. I just want to say to you all, here we are again. We're, we're all gathered round at exorbitant expenses to be here, and once again we've got deflections, insults, petty name-calling, and, and no one... Is it, I just want to know, like, I'm going to ask all of you individually, I'd, I'd, and I want an answer. Do you actually believe your own campaigns? Because, like... How, as in, the Leave campaign, will, the Leave campaign will throw out a figure, 
that, that you'll rubbish and then you'll, they'll, you'll find out that they'll rubbish. What are we supposed to do? I do not have an issue admitting I have no idea what to do and I blame you lot entirely for that. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Some more views on the campaign. Yes, hello. I'm uh, Jason from Dundee. And, uh, what, do you, what do you think of the campaign so far? Has it engaged you? I completely agree with Kieran. I am just hearing, like, just tit for tat across there. And is it any wonder we're sat here undecided when we're hearing these petty arguments across the room? And it's exactly what uh, Alex was saying. You know, they've got the economy on one side, they've got immigration on the other. And that's the card that they play. Get the emotions ramped up, people start arguing. And guess what? There's more people in the middle than there are on the other side. Do you feel how, how significant a decision? is this for you? Uh, for me, I'm uh, one of the older ones here, actually, um, on the closer side of 30 than most people. But um, I'm a homeowner and I work for a multinational company that's based in the UK. So two very, very important issues for me are what impact that have on my job, mm. security, interest rates, mortgage rates, um, the ability to travel across Europe, enjoy holidays. All these things matter to me, okay. and I'm not hearing any any good reasons from either side. At All the right. moment, I'm just here on tip for tap. I want to ask Leave and Remain, what do you think of the Leave campaign? Um, I think the Leave campaign have been scaremongering and it's been appalling, but I'd like to ask... So your own side, you think, have been appalling? I, I think... In the what way, way we, have they been scaremongering? Um, just some of the noise that we've heard about immigration and how awful it will be if we stay, but... I mean, I do want to leave, mm. and I think we will be better if we do leave, but I think we should be putting across the good point. Oh, but true. I just want to ask the Remain side, if David Cameron believes all this scaremongering that we're going to have a World War III, that <laughs> our economy is going to be completely awful, why are we having a referendum? Surely someone that cares about the country wouldn't give us one if it was that dangerous. We are where we are, aren't we? I mean, you can answer that if you I just want to... You come back to you in a second, but... What do you think of the Remain sides campaign? I think the, Re oh. I think the Remain campaign should be talking more about the benefits within Europe. What do you think of it so far, then? What's wrong with it? I think they're focusing too much on the economy. Apathy is always the biggest winner in any UK election, and I can see the same happening again. Okay. I can see this election being won than less than 50% of the UK population, in all honesty. I think that more majority of people aren't going to turn out to vote which to me... And, 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 and if, if that turns out to be the case, are you saying that's because of the quality of the debate? I think it's the quality of the debate, the tit-for-tat, the useless politicians' argument. And I think more should be done to sp speak about the benefits of staying within Europe. Every single one of here, I'm assuming, has owns a smartphone. It's not EU. It's the EU. EU. OK, sorry, I beg your pardon, EU. I'm using it as an umbrella term, so I beg your pardon, I'll change to EU. Oh, look, give her a chance. Can, can she, let, let her finish the sentence. Go on. The two, the two to me are interchangeable, OK? You're choosing... Here we are, a perfect example of tit for tat. Can I finish? For the remain. Can you, excuse me. Sorry. Hang on a minute, sir. Do finish your sentence. Yes. Yeah. I'm sure that the majority of us here all own a smartphone. Come at the beginning of next month, EU data charges are going to go down within Europe. But, <laughs> but no, let me finish. Let me finish. It's a good reason. This feels like reason. I'm in the House of Commons here and it's Prime Minister's questions. <laughs> They're very aggressive. I went to France, say, 2012. My phone bill when I got home because I was uploading pictures to... Oh, for goodness sake, be well, respectful. I'll come to you in a minute. I'm making a valid point here. OK. Oh. <laughs> you know that's not the figure. That's right, let's point. talk about anyway. the quality of the campaigning. I... Diane James, from your own side, your campaign is appalling. You have concentrated on immigration, and that's not good, according to the woman on your side. I don't agree that it's appalling. Uh, but one of the aspects of concentrating on migration, not immigration, we've concentrated on migration on the basis that that's one very clear example where the UK government, people that you elect, people like the three gentlemen here, to represent you in the House of Commons, actually don't have control over a key aspect of the, of the economy. And so some of the questions that we've already had 
the, uh, the aspect that I brought up is that if you can't control the number of people, if you can't control demand because you can't control supply, you're forever in a spiral downwards. But you, now, can, you, can, you can control net migration from outside the EU. And we had the latest figures 330,000 today, 180,000 which, which, which show that as EU. many people are coming from outside the EU, which Britain can control, as are coming from within the EU. Yes, but what we do know oh. is we want, for instance, more medics, more nurses, more engineers. Those key STEM, uh, if you like, uh, people that have been trained in those key subjects. We are unable to control that except on an exception and if, basis. And if Britain left, how would you control EU immigration? What would change? Well, what, are, by the, the simple basis that if it says no, please, by the simple basis, if they meet the skills that this country actually wants, they would then become a priority. So it would, be, it would be visas. No, it wouldn't be visas. We, we know, Alan, we know, Alan, that we want doctors. If we've got qualified doctors in Commonwealth countries, in Australia, in New Zealand, in Canada, at the moment, France, they Denmark, are... They, yeah, Estonia, but maybe. Lithuania. But maybe, but why not have somebody who, from the Commonwealth, somebody who speaks our language, hasn't oh, got to cover oh, their back? Oh, no. oh. Well, I do have an issue with that, what? actually, Alan. Oh. Alec, I do. That... I do. Oh, you... Do you want to, re you want to respond well, I, I, to that? I, I, th I think if, uh, if I wanted a doctor, then a, a qualified Lithuanian, French, German, Danish doctor would do me just fine. <laughs> interesting exchange between two members of the audience. The lady was talking about how roaming charges were going to be abolished. Now, that is a, an achievement of the European Union. It's maybe not the biggest achievement. And the lady over here said that's nothing like the fake figure of £350 million pounds a week. <laughs> Actually, okay. if you take the real figure, Victoria, it translates into 26 pence a day for every one of us. About half a Mars bar. Now, I don't know what the young lady's phone bill is, but I'm sure her roaming charges were more than 26 pence okay. a day. Now, okay. it's not the most okay. important thing about Europe, but it is a significant All right, we've got more questions to come. Hang on a sec. We have got more questions to come. Do not worry. And I can see people with their hands up, and we will try and come to you. Uh, just let me tell you that after nine tonight some of our audience and guests will be taking part in a Facebook live conversation on the BBC News account. Okay, uh, let's go to our next question and in fact we'll take two together because they're kind of related. Um, Stephanie Muir from Glasgow and Coyote Damali from Crewe. Hi Coyote. Hi. My, name, my name is Coyote Damali and I'm a university motivational speaker living in Cheshire. Now, it's very clear that people living in the UK enjoy moving and travelling around Europe. So now my question is, if we were to leave the EU, how difficult would it be then to move and travel around Europe in the future? OK, and Stephanie, let's hear your question. Um, Where's Stephanie? Here. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, um, I'm a student and I intend to study abroad at some point. So what will we lose and what will we gain in terms of international relations and travel if we leave the EU? OK, shall we take that one first? Liam Fox. I don't think you need to lose anything at all. There is a world outside the European Union. People do go and study and travel and have holidays elsewhere. Um, my dad was uh, uh, taught French and Spanish, and long before we were in the European Union, we used to have holidays in France and Spain. And people did continue to go and study uh, in other countries. That, that will continue. Why do we have these arrangements? because it's genuinely in the interest of both parties to do so. People want to come and study in our country. It's good for us to go and study elsewhere. The idea that because we're not in the European Union, you're not going to be able to have a holiday in Mallorca is, just, is getting well, no, too, no is getting is, too no ridiculous. No one is, to be fair, no one is suggesting that we're not going to be able to have a holiday in Mallorca if you want one. According to the Complete University Guide, as members of the EU, anyone here would usually be able to study in other EU nations as home students. Yep. That's right. Compared to the fees charged to international students, home fees are generally lower or non-existent. But it's easy, here's the, the difference, uh, that young lady at the back, the, the point about the difference between Europe and the European Union, because programmes like Erasmus, which have got bigger uh, student programmes, are not just That's the European... That's an exchange Yes, program. the exchange programme is not just the European Union, it's the European continent. So it's countries like Turkey as well, Norway, Iceland as that. Oh. The, Europe is a great continent of individual nations with their own history. The European Union's a political construct. But Europe, <laughs> Europe, Europe and exchange 
and trade and travel existed before there was a European but Union. Stephanie's and Stephanie's fees might continue. be higher if Britain is outside the European Union, if she wants to go and study at a university abroad. Well, why would that be? Because the programmes are decided because they're in the mutual interest. It's the same as trade. It's in both our interests to do why so. Why would that be? That's why we do it. Members of the and, EU. and we have had all these programmes before we're in the European Union, and we'll have them when we're not in the European Union, just as we have programmes and people study in the United States or Canada. I don't have a lot of money. I'm working class. I have like a tiny wage because I'm on a zero hour contract. Where am I supposed to get the, the money from to actually these increased fees? What, how am I supposed to support myself in another country if it's not going to be treated like home? But who's <laughs> but you're, make, you're making an assumption here that because we're not in the European Union, Germany's not going to want German students to come to the UK and we're not going to want to go to study in okay. Germany. I don't think that makes any sense. All right, and I Alex, think, I think that we'll have agreements uh, because, because it's in right, both our interests to do so. I just want to make a point because it comes back to what Diane was saying. This is a crucial issue about whether if we're outside the European Union we would need visas to travel. At the moment we have a very beneficial system. We can go anywhere within the European Union. Uh, it's a two-way process. You know, no other country has more of its citizens living and working in other developed countries than Great Britain. Now, if we're not to have visas, and Diane, you said we wouldn't, for, to, to go on holiday or for people to come here, there are 2.5 million tourists who come to Scotland every year. How are you going to differentiate between the Polish plumber and the Polish tourist? It means, surely, a system of visas. And if you haven't got a system of visas, then how are you going to deal with... You're going to be telling people we're going to stop free movement, but you're not going to introduce visas, so free movement will still be there. And you're also, incidentally, unless you put a border and watchtowers across the border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, going to have people coming across there, because it would then be an EU country okay. and a non-EU country. Well, that's, so, so that's, that's dealing also with Coyote's point about... Easy. I mean, you can just get up and go anywhere in Europe. Can you, like... I can leave right now if I wanted to. And just... Bye. <laughs> you can come with me if you want. We can go together. I but do you? I mean, do you... <laughs> no, don't laugh. I'm being serious. I don't laugh. <laughs> I haven't got a visa. Um, I mean, are you? Are you? Can you be clear about this? Are you saying if Britain votes to leave? there would be visas or not. No, the, right. Victoria, we just don't know. We oh. just <laughs> don't know. Because we have a Prime Minister who has said there is no plan B. He's not presented a single bit of detail as to what happens if we vote to leave, and he's left it all completely open. We've even got a civil so service. So you don't know what it, would look, what it would feel like, I'm, what it would look like? I'm, 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 what I'm doing, I'm responding to you by saying we don't know, I, I don't believe we will need visas. We suddenly seem to be... Of, it's all part of the project fear, Victoria. It's about if we leave, all of a sudden, Fortress Europe puts up the barriers and stops all of this happening. It's, now, what okay. is very clear from Mr Juncker in, the, in the, uh, the European Parliament, he's the one who started the scaremongering this time round. In the last few days, we've been accused of being deserters. He's, he's now saying that he's going to penalise us, which is the executive arm. And it's responsible EU. politicians and a responsible Prime Minister that conducts the negotiations and should have, by this stage, identified look, that sort of thing. Let's hear more is, from our audience it. here, particularly the undecideds. Uh, yes. Hello. Do introduce yourself. Hello. Hi, I'm Sorrel. I'm 21 and I'm an events manager. Um, kind of, it seems to be in every single point that's been brought up, it's going to be something to do with migration or immigration. It's not it, 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 every point is sort of tied into that. So one of the things I want to say to you guys is you're saying that if people want to go and study in the EU, then that's fine because that's mutually uh, beneficial. Both sides can go back and forth. So why would it be OK for us to send students abroad and have students from abroad come to us, yet not allow people to go and live somewhere else and somebody to keep them live and work here? OK, let's have some quick points. I do want point. Down here, the gentleman at the front. Um, I'd just like you to address Alan Johnson's point about the Northern Irish border, to be honest, because I've been think, like, I think a lot of people have been murmuring about that, but it's not really been discussed in a, in a mainstream debate, and I just wanted to hear what the Leave side had to say about that, really. Do you want to take that? Yeah, can I, the, the lady behind you, just to take her point first. Um, so, yes, you're quite right. Where you get exchanges, whether it's students, whether it's people who are working, you can get mutual benefit from doing that. 
My problem with the European Union is it's uncontrolled when it comes to migration. I, I'm a doctor. I can see the benefit of other European doctors coming into this country. But we need to control the total flow or you get a problem with access to things like the health service. And on this gentleman in the front's point, we always had agreements with the Republic that were bilateral. Uh, before we were in the European Union. Why would we want to have different arrangements today? Well, they always worked before we were in the okay. EU. But and the and, and, just, and the th the th just to answer that gentleman's question, which I don't think was answered, um, just because um, we are able to uh, uh, travel freely, it's different from working freely. I'm all for people being able to come as tourists freely into this country, but if they want to work in the United Kingdom, they would need to get a work permit, just like somebody who came from outside the European Union. It is not beyond the wit of man to allow no. tourists to travel freely, but to make sure you've got a work permit <laughs> when you want to work here. <laughs> have a million people coming from Europe to take the jobs in the UK. Let's be real, there's no, no one from Europe coming to take any jobs from any British workers if we have to your name, two GCCs and STI. You're know saying there's no one, they're not coming to do that. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, who, it doesn't matter who they are. If you've got the qualifications and if you can do the job, then I don't really see a problem with it. And you so even said I. earlier yeah, at the beginning I. of the debate, you even said earlier that you have people, you said due to our great economy here in the UK, that you have people from Europe wanting to come to study here. You even said that, so why is okay. that a bad thing? Because hang on, more, quite, hang and on. I'm quite happy to have Liam that, Fox, hang on. but I want to be able to control the process, okay. to control who Let's... comes to the United Kingdom. That's reasonable for the British people to want to do that. Yes, hello. Hi. Uh, uh, I'm Tonia. I'm from Manchester and I'm a student. Um, and I, I, just, I, I, I take the gentleman's point and I think that the lady made a really excellent point on, on immigration. Um, I'm very pro-migration, but I, I do wonder why, from the, from the Remain campaign, I wonder why um, we would discriminate towards um, people from within the EU. I mean, if we're talking about, um, you know, people bringing skills and people, I mean, I think we should take people like anyway, but if we want certain skills in particular, I do wonder why we would discriminate against people from India, Africa, China, who have the good skills we want. I'm not sure what that's about. Yeah, that's a very good point. Well, I mean, I think it's an excellent point. I'm currently battling to, to keep a, an Australian family who were attracted to Scotland to the Highlands in the, in the Homeland Highlands campaign, which, uh, which we had when, uh, when I was First Minister, who are now getting kicked out of the country. I think that family should be able to stay and contribute to the, the Highlands of Scotland, the Brain family. So I think your point is an excellent one. But you see, when Stephanie asked a practical question about would she be able to go and study elsewhere in Europe, what we got from Diane was she wasn't didn't know, and what we got from Liam was he wanted to control the process, which inevitably means either work permits or visas. And the whole beauty of the situation we're in at the present moment with the European Union is we don't need visas, and Stephanie has an absolute right to go and study anywhere in the European Union, and this side cannot guarantee that. OK, OK. <laughs> Sorry, we need a microphone or else we can't hear you. Hello. Just... Hang on, hang on, hang on, wait, 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 go for it. There are a lot of students here. You're all choosing to study in the UK. Why have you chosen to study in the UK? Why do European students choose to come to the UK and study here? Why don't you go abroad and study in Europe? If you're able to already, why don't you? The reason is you don't want to. You don't want to because our universities are better. We're better than the EU. That's why we want, that's why we should leave. Okay. <laughs> OK, let me read some comments from people who are listening and watching right around the UK. Uh, UK Age on, on Twitter says, personal, reason is, personal reasons are the reasons why I wish to remain in the EU, travelling without visas, and I can live and work uh, within the EU without any concerns at all. Use the hashtag BBC debate if you're tweeting. Uh, I think we can reform the UK once we leave the European Union um, and the globalisation uh, benefits the ultra-rich whilst penalising the poor. Uh, do keep those coming in. If you want to find out more about anything that has come up tonight, then the BBC's Reality Check have been fact-checking all the details. Just go to the BBC News site. OK, next question is from Eleanor, who is from Dundee. Hi, I'm Eleanor Leslie from Dundee. I'm a student. And I'm just wondering if um, Scotland voted one way and <clears throat> the rest of Britain voted the other way, would it lead to another unwanted independence referendum in Scotland? I wonder who should answer that. <laughs> <laughs> well, by definition, it couldn't be an unwanted one because it would have to be wanted because it would only be if the Scottish Parliament proposed it. Um, the... Sorry, unwanted to you, yes. Elder. It would create a democratic mandate for it, so I think the Scottish well, Government will try and push for it, even though 
it's already gone ahead what, two years ago and the yeah, vote came out as no. Yeah, sure, but it would, have to, it, would have to, it would have to be a democratic mandate because the First Minister last year in the general election said this, if Scotland was dragged out of Europe against our will, uh, then that would be a change in circumstances that would justify another referendum. And the SNP, the SNP won 56 out of 59 seats. In the recent Scottish election, it was in the SNP manifesto, uh, and again, there was a big victory for the SNP. So by definition, it cannot be... It cannot, well, it's, it's actually 47% of the vote which is the biggest mandate of any governing party in Western Europe. Now, I'm just pointing out, you can only have the circumstance if a majority of the Scottish Parliament vote for it. And that would mean, as you rightly say, not just the SNP, but the Green Party. So by definition, it can only be wanted and it can and only be democratic. If, if the circumstances arise, which you have described, when might that second independence referendum well, it, it would have to be within the two-year period of the UK negotiating a withdrawal. So in, in the next two years? In the next two years? If, if you had the situation where Scotland in four weeks' time votes remain and the rest of the UK or England drags Scotland out by voting to leave, then that would justify, in my opinion, another referendum because during the referendum of 2014, the people of Scotland were told that voting no would secure Scotland's position within the European Union. Okay. Now, I know it sounds ironic now, but that's hang what on, they said two on, years ago. Liam, Liam Fox, a Scotsman, albeit representing an English constituency, what do you say to Alex Salmond on that? Well, well first of all, Nicola Sturgeon said it was a once-in-a-lifetime referendum. <laughs> Who but, said that? But, but, but on this point, I, I've never been very sure uh, what the SNP didn't understand about the result. The Scottish well, people voted to stay in the United Kingdom. <laughs> and, that's, and that's important. It's very important on the EU point because our membership of the European Union is a decision we take as the United Kingdom. And that's why, that's why in the referendum, that's why in the referendum every vote counts the same. We don't count them in constituencies, we don't count them in districts. Every vote's the same, whether it's in Stornoway or St Ives. It's a decision for all the people of the United Kingdom, and we should take it on the merits of the European Union debate and not be sidetracked into yet another okay. fear campaign about a Scottish referendum. All Let's right. do it Hang on its merits. OK. We're going to move on to... If there was another independence referendum in the next two years, would you win that? In the circumstances of Scotland being threatened or being dragged out of the European Union against her will, I think the result would be yes this time. OK. OK. Right, next question. Next question is from Dawn. Hi, Dawn. Hi. Where are um, you? Oh, you're there. Hello. Hi. My name's Dawn. I'm a student um, currently studying in Aberdeen. I want to know if there would be any disadvantages or advantages to the NHS, depending on what way the vote went. You're a student, uh, you're a student nurse, Student nurse, you? yeah. OK. What advantages, disadvantages would there be for the NHS in the event of voting to leave or stay? Uh, Diane James. Well, I think the first thing, I'll, I it may sound as though I'm repeating myself, but I think we could, by controlling who comes here, prioritise where we want people to, in terms of skills. The reason so, that we're bringing in so many, so yeah. many for, foreign but, nurses, as you said... So, for um, instance, we, we know there's something them. like uh, 9,000, I think it is, deficit in terms of nursing numbers. Mm -hmm. We know that, uh, or at least I understand, that the whole nurse training programme in the UK was effectively cancelled, and that's why we've had to go elsewhere around the world to bring in nurses. I would far rather see people like yourself go through the nurse training programme and work here. That's what I want to see. Equally, I would like to see medics, like we have done over decades now, coming from the Commonwealth countries, from India, from Pakistan, places like that. Unlike what Alec accused me of, I am not against European uh, NHS staff. What I said was, let, let me just correct you, please. What I said was that I would like to prioritise on people here in the United Kingdom and prioritise on the skills that we actually want in terms of medics, nurses, doctors, surgeons, I don't care what they are, and that we go to the countries where we've got a good relationship, where we've had individuals from those countries historically, okay. and where we know we can trust their skill base. And Alan Johnson. I think, I think of all the arguments that the Leave side are putting forward, I think the NHS is the most ludicrous. We've had uh, the current chief executive of the NHS and his two predecessors 
saying, look, the NHS is a tax-based system. It's, it's not a free system. It's free at the point of use, but it's paid by taxpayers. If our economy shrinks, the NHS is in trouble. Well, and going back to what we were saying no, earlier, no, no, no. every... Wait, well, wait, I'll tell wait. you about... Don't just shout I'll tell you about out. TTIP in a second. But let me just deal with the first question. So uh, uh, every, uh, all of those economic forecasts say that our economy would be badly damaged. At the moment, incidentally, this is the problem with the NHS. Uh, the NHS needs to be at the European average of spend. In Europe, they spend about 9% of their wealth on the NHS. We were doing that up until 2010. Now it's gone back to 6%. That's the problem. Putting as much of our wealth into the NHS that matches the European average, not using the NHS as some kind of argument to leave the European okay. Union. <laughs> Do either of those answers help you reach? Uh, a lot, but yeah. In what way? Yeah. What are um, you thinking? What do you think of what Diane James said? What do you think of what Alan Johnson said? Well, I, I don't really think Diane answered my question, to be perfectly honest. I think it was just more of the same. Good night. Liam Fox. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I trained as a doctor here, here in Glasgow, so, but one of the things that's absolutely true about the NHS is from the very beginning of the NHS, we've never really trained enough doctors given the way that medicine's expanding and the problems that patients are having. So we do need to have more doctors. I'm all for having Briefly. more doctors and we have to get them from abroad. If we have uncontrolled numbers in the UK from wherever they come, that puts pressure on health services. And the NHS this year, according <coughs> to Simon Stevens, the head of the NHS has a deficit of £2.45 billion. Pounds. Okay. And we're sending £10 billion to the European Union. Oh, okay. that one out. Yeah. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, there are about 55 people who arrived here tonight undecided. And we're going to ask them, if it's OK with them, if any have reached a decision on how they're going to vote. You may still be undecided after what you've heard tonight. And that's fine. That in itself will be pretty telling. But perhaps you've heard something from one of our guests or from a, a fellow member of the audience that might, might have helped you reach a decision conclusion one way or the other so if you have made a decision to do put your hands down for a second if you have made a decision please do put your hand up now wow that's about half of you I would say would you agree okay let me ask you down here at the front what decision have you made and why I want to now remain part of the EU um, you want to what sorry I want to stay um, and what is it that you've heard? <laughs> from question one, from question one, that was my mind made up. My main issue was about jobs. OK, all right. If you have decided to vote the other way and you want to tell us why, please do put your hand up. Um, I don't feel like the Remain campaign has given any real idea of what the potential reforms would be if we were to, to stay in the, the EU. It seems that everyone on both sides seems to think that reform is needed quite heavily in the EU. And the Remain campaign don't really give us any idea of what those reforms would need to be and how long it would take for them to, to OK. Happen. And those who are still undecided, just put your hands up if you're still undecided. Just put your hands up for me. So, OK, let's... let's what, what is it going to take, can I ask you, in the, yeah, in the next few weeks? What, what, are you, what assurances do you still need in order to make up your mind? I think there's a lot of um, different things that people are saying about like the budgets and how much we give in, how much we take out. No one has an actual answer to what that budget is. Everyone's saying one number, some people are saying another. And it's just things like that. We need like statistics that are real and that everyone can agree on. Do you think you're going to get those in the next um, four weeks? I hope we do, but <laughs> oh, that's just me being hopeful. <laughs> OK, all right. That is it for tonight. Uh, the debate continues now on Five Live and the BBC News Channel. Thank you very much to our guests, Alan Johnson, Alex Salmon, Diane James and Liam Fox. And thank you to our audience tonight. Do give yourselves a big round of applause. Thank you.